right, everyone. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this is brought to you by the Alzheimer's Association and New Hanover County Public Library. We like to partner quarterly to help reach our patrons and the services that anybody here in the area may need. Um, Brooke is just wonderful to work with. We really, really like this partnership that we have going and we look forward to offering more programs in the future to you all. Um, so today's programming program is on managing money, a caregiver's guide. Um, and please feel free to reach out to the library or to Alzheimer's Association in the future if you have any questions, if you have any requests for programs, we are always happy to, um, to talk to you about that. So with that, I'm gonna pass this over to Brooke. Thank you all so much for being here today. Hi everyone, I'm Brooke Ballaly. I am a program manager in Eastern and Coastal North Carolina, and I want to introduce our volunteer community educator today. His name is Nick Maggard, and he is a nationally recognized speaker, expert on a variety of estate planning, financial topics, and founder of Maggard Elder Law, LLC, and Leg Legacy Retirement and Estate Planning Group. He's a sought after expert, mentor, and speaker within the financial and legal community. So we are really blessed to be able to have him present this new program, Managing Money, a Caregiver's Guide to Finances, which is now evidence-based. So that's really exciting news for us. He's been in, Nick has been interviewed by the Wall Street Journal and Chicago Tribune, as well as noted in articles in Kiplinger, U.S. World News, and World Report. And having experienced the loss of a loved one, Nick knows how much work goes into financial and estate planning and just how much value there is in having a complete plan in place. So when he's not in the office, he does enjoy various sports like basketball and soccer, and most importantly, values the time he spends with his wife, Andrea, and their four children. He is local to the area. He's in Hampstead, so he's pretty close for the majority of us on the call. And I will go ahead and turn it over to Nick. Um, as a quick reminder, please drop any questions that you have in the chat. I'll keep note of them if I can answer them or, or provide links, I will. If not, I'll give pass them off to Nick um, when he wraps up. Thank you. All right, everybody. Um, if the administrator is able to, uh, the, the host can share or allow uh, the my ability to share the screen and then I can pull up the PowerPoint presentation. I just need a little admin from the host. Gotcha. Uh, Let me see. Yeah. And, then, and my name again is Nick Maggard. Um, this is all I do is work with seniors. Um, I focus my career on elder law and I provide financial insurance, but but also trust planning and estate planning um, help. Today, though, is going to be different than my typical estate planning workshop. Our focus is on the Alzheimer's Association's um, evidence-based program. And so I'm going to be delivering this program. And uh, it's a new program for me. So I'm going to, you know, go through the slides as best as I can. But if there are particular questions, as long as it's not a specific question, but you just want a general advice, um, that's not legal advice. Um, general advice is, hey, how does this work? Or, you know, how does the power of attorney work when, when, you know, in this type of scenario. And then the hypothetical uh, legal uh, answer is not going to violate any attorney client privilege or um, unauthorized practice of law because we're doing a public educational free workshop here. So we're, so if you do have a general question, I had to give that disclaimer. If you have a general question, please put it in the chats. And then uh, at some point, um, maybe even towards the end, uh, I'll be able to then go right into that and, and answer uh, a broad uh, answer for you. And that, that way you can get some of the specific things that you need on here. So I'm going to go ahead and click share. Yep, it works. Thank you so much. Okay, can can everybody see? Yes? Uh, let me uh, check yes. to make sure that audio is, if anybody's not hearing me, please, please make a note, but it, Everything seems to be on. Okay, so today the, the program by the Alzheimer's Association is a caregiver's guide to finances. All 
All right, so we're going to jump in. Again, if you have any questions, you can ask questions. There is going to be um, uh, help um, in the chat. So feel free to text that and then uh, and then we can kind of jump into there. All right, now, is the program, are you guys able to see the slideshow or is is uh, is everything looking correct? Actually, Nick, you have your um, the notes that are on there instead of the actual PowerPoint. Okay, so yeah, let me look then to see. Yeah, I see what you mean. There we go. That's it. Okay. There we go. Perfect. And then let me make sure. I don't see anywhere for the full screen, but I think this is good. If everyone can see it. I think we can just jump right in. So yeah, we can okay. see it. So, the project was supported by um, a grant and it's an educational general. We're not giving any legal advice. Uh, we're trying to provide a lot of resources, a lot of information to you. Uh, but as with everything, you know, if you need medical, legal, any kind of particular advice, you really got to sit down with a professional um, and, and kind of go through that process. But if you're here for information, then you're at the right place. So the steering committee, we just want to give recognition recognition to if you everyone can kind of look through uh, all those names there, rather than going through and me reading it each one. And then what are our objectives? One, caregiving is 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 a has a big impact, and we want to make sure what's the effect on finances. We want to talk about legal and financial documents. Is it a will? Is it a power of attorney? Is it a living will? Healthcare document? These are a lot of topics that uh, I get cut questions on every week. Uh, prepare for useful discussions about financial decisions and planning. Preparation of pre-planning is the name of the game. And then there, unfortunately, is a lot of financial abuse and fraud. And so we want to make sure that you have... Uh, awareness of different, you know, obstacles or uh, indicators that might show some of this abuse and fraud. And then we can kind of create a backup plan um, as well, in case you particularly are not able to provide any of the care. So a caregiver, care partner is a family member, a friend, it could be a niece, a nephew, um, it could be a neighbor. You know, those are types of scenarios where we see different people having to step up as a caregiver or volunteering their time, or maybe it's uh, for a fee. A lot of times we look at caregiver contracts uh, to make sure that that individual is being paid uh, legally. Um, so that way, if there's ever an issue with nursing home or Medicaid, uh, the under the table payments um, will run into problems. But if you do things through a contract and through payments, um, that's the way to go. Finances, money and things that are worth money, and financial literacy. Understanding money. I mean, it, it's, it's not a fun topic, but it is an important topic. So what is the cost? So financial literacy is, is really important for caregivers because it provides them knowledge and skills needed to support other people. What's the percentage of caregivers that have an out-of-pocket cost as a result of caregivers? Do you want to type in a number in the chat if that's okay? Just curious to see what everybody thinks. There we go. More than three quarters of caregivers, 78% have out-of-pocket expenses. I've seen it in my practice nationally, North Carolina, Kentucky, you know, all the different states that that I've helped people in. That that's that's there. Impact on employment. Obviously, it's going to affect employment. A lot of caregivers reduce their hours or maybe their stress. Um, and so it is a burden on being able to continue at their job at the normal uh, ability of doing that. They've had to take off work. Um, they've had to quit their jobs, you know, they're, they're, and then that can have a lot of impacts on the caregiver itself, whether they're paying into Social Security, uh, whether they're setting up their own retirement, uh, whether they have the health and stress uh, levels adequate, um, obviously debt. That can be a huge detriment that can last for years and years. So there is an impact. Impact on health. So I mentioned that, but caregiving 
you know, that involves a lot of time, a lot of energy, and it does have an impact on your health, right? You have stress, um, whether it's healthy stress or it crosses that line into the negative stress. And caregivers often put off taking care of their own needs. You know, we see this um, this this uh, volunteer type of um, aspect where they're sacrificing a lot of their own uh, health and you know eating habits, and they're not taking enough time to kind of go on a break or walk or get out in the sun, and so that is going to put off their own health, and then that's going to have a negative impact, as well as additional medical expenses. Now, Alzheimer's disease, obviously it's gonna have an effect, but let's ask this question. If you wanna type in, Alzheimer's is a normal part of aging. True or false? Alzheimer's is a progressive and fatal brain disease. So some of this I wanna just read so that just kind of reiterate what you're seeing here, because it's, it's, it's important to, to build this foundation before we kind of get into a lot of the practical uh, legal or financial topics that people a lot oftentimes ask about. Alzheimer's only affects a person's memory. Is that true or false? That's false. So the, the disease progression, Alzheimer's pro progresses, you know, in slow stages, three stages, the early, the middle, and the late. And it does impact on one's ability to manage money. As the disease gets worse, often you have zero ability to manage money, which that's where you want a plan in place. You want people that you've designated to be able to step up in those situations where you have the inability to handle your financial affairs without having to go to court and, and deal with the guardianship proceeding, preferably. The financial impact on caregivers. Income's going down, you're less time that's devoted, um, and expenses, especially if you have out-of-pocket, that's going up. Unique challenges for caregivers. Dementia caregivers have twice the average out-of-pocket caregiving costs. 30 to 40% of dementia caregivers experience depression. Anxiety is 44%, and women are more likely to experience the stress of it than men. So let's check your knowledge again to kind of stay on top of uh, what is being presented here. People younger than 65, can they develop Alzheimer's? Yes. Yes, they can. I'm sure most of you know that, but it's good to kind of reiterate that. And it helps broaden the education to the wider community. Additional challenges. Well, people living with younger onset Alzheimer's faces a lot of challenges. One, they quit their jobs or they lost their jobs because of the commitment that it takes to be a caregiver. If that's the case, then there's issues with COBRA, uh, insurance, and, and everything that's related to that. People living with the young, younger onset Alzheimer's and their care partners have less time to plan for the future, which is really setting up their own emergency fund and their retirement um, plan. Care partners, uh, are individuals who face a unique challenge. Maybe they have to return to work, um, they have to get another job to supplement the income that they've lost. Uh, they have their own families to take care of, children and that cost, and they're no longer able to save for the children's um, college edu expect educational expenses like a 529 plan. Maybe they have their own uh, ongoing uh, monthly expenses like a mortgage or car loans, and then the debt increases. Um, and then there are resources that are available for people who are 65 and older. We see that um, in the LGBTQ community, more likely to be single, often live alone, less likely to have children. A person um, living with Alzheimer's will end up needing um, someone else to take care of, you know, your day-to-day -day expenses and your bills and, and, and all that. Uh, may qualify for services that are offered at no or little. So, you know, there's a lot of impacts uh, that, that this is going to have on your income. Who can benefit from putting financial plans in place for the future? Well, who do you think? You think it's only people with a lot of money? Absolutely not. I found that if someone has $500,000 to someone that has $20,000, 
as a net worth. And in and, and every situation, it seems that the individual's assets, what they own, that's important to them. It doesn't matter uh, what the value is. Therefore, having the ability to have a plan in place is important for every single person, regardless of how much income or assets you own. So every, every segment needs to set up a good plan. And early planning, you know, you want to talk to uh, the person's, you know, find out what the person's wishes are. You want to find out um, how they would want to, um, how they want a situation to go. Um, there's always the tough conversation of the living will, which is end of life and having a conversation and it preferably even having them fill out and complete a living will form and having that notarized and witnessed. That way everybody is on the same page as far as what the person's wishes are. Also having a conversation about expenses and which expenses do they want to be continued? Which expenses do they not want to be continued? And if possible, how they want to handle gifting, how they want to be able to handle inheritance. And th those are more the estate planning type of questions. What kind of care do they want? Where do they want to go? What facility? Um, having a conversation of short-term, long-term, uh, in-home, independent facility, assisted facility. Th these are great questions to have with the family um, and even having a professional to be able to have that conversation or a coach or an attorney or a, an advisor. Um, those are the, those are those are really important people to bring in because it's one of the most difficult times and a lot of times your emotions and stress can reduce the ability to make the best decisions and so having outside help people that have your back and care for you is going to go a long way a lot of people want to just get the information and then and then they 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 kind of go into something and then there's a problem and then another problem and another problem. And before you know it, then they bring in an expert. And at that point, it might be pretty difficult to correct a lot of the issues. Benefits of early planning. You have the ability to find out exactly what the individual wants. You get reassurance and you have a peace of mind from having all your plans in place. There is a peace of mind that comes with knowing I've set up uh, my power of attorneys, and I've set up my beneficiary designations, and I've done everything that I need to do, um, or I've helped the individual who has Alzheimer's, maybe an early uh, signs of it, get everything in line. It provides a lot of peace of mind. Financial discussions. Talking about money can uh, make people feel anxious and uncomfortable. You see that more with certain generations. Um, and so, it is hard to find a way to start that conversation. Uh, some tips would be writing down your goals. You know, just kind of asking, you know, if this situation comes up, you know, what are your expectations? How would you, uh, how would you see the best way for this to be handled? And then maybe talking about some important documents and just mentioning those and writing that down, having a list of key people, um, you know, you can bring in different people to have this conversation, but you can also make a list. Uh, I have a, a lot of clients who would make a list and they'll just put key key persons and they'll put close friends and there maybe their phone number. Maybe they'll put their pastor or clergy phone number, their advisor, attorney phone number, um, different family members. Um, that way you have a piece of paper that has everybody that's important that that needs or could become a, a person that you would need to have a conversation with and it's all in one place and then loved ones can be able to grab that and, and be able to deal with the crisis um, when it comes in the future choosing a calm time of day in a quiet place again if you really want to have the most out of a good conversation because of how important this is it's all about timing it's about coming into it with the right intention, the right uh, emotions, right, of caring and um, humility and, and not being too pushy or too aggressive. Know that it can be hard to ask for help, especially uh, with someone who has dementia. And again, repeating what are the individual's wishes without any judgment. 
there's any kind of difficulty in communicating, then the tips are to um, kind of maybe have a piece of paper and show some different bullet points, short sentences, um, keeping it simple, but, but kind of direct and open and not really judging, which, you know, requires that positive touch. So you start with the positive statement. If you need um, to write this down at a later date, you can, you know, you can, I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to get your hands on the presentation, but these being able to have kind of a, not necessarily a script, you want to put everything into your own words, but being able to phrase a sentence the right way can go a long, can go a long way. So these are some examples of that. I want to talk to you about my finances so you can access them in case of an emergency. So now you put context on why. I really want you to understand my wishes for the future. And that's more on your on your side as well. Having conversations about finances. So th this is a great um, resource. It really helps break it down. Can't really get into all the details at this moment, but but that's going to be something that you uh, can have at a later date and look it over and, and bring with you in the conversation. It's very important to be aware of the indicators of abuse and fraud. On average, and I'd like to hear in the chat just for you know, um, sake of the presentation, how much money do Americans age 80 and older lose each year as a result of financial abuse, fraud, and scams? And if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see chat there. It looks like we're, we're getting active chats. So there we go. Let's see how many people got it right. 39,200. So we really wanna make, spend some time on this because um, it is, it's becoming more and more common. Financial abuse can occur in any setting. Um, individuals living with dementia risk have a greater risk of becoming the victim and they might not even remember being uh, victimized uh, or even having the abuse or uh, reporting the abuse. And there's obviously gonna be some tough, uh, some difficult ability to make financial decisions, which is gonna again, lead to the ability for uh, predators and creditors, as I refer to it, to kind of take advantage or um, perhaps the fraud um, or abuse comes from uh, trusted individuals as well, like family members even. Um, Here's some indicators. And it's good to know this, you know, if you see unopened bills, uh, the gas getting shut off, large purchases, you know, monitoring the, the bank statements to be able to catch these sort of things. That's that's where I get a lot of phone calls is someone um, who's keeping a careful eye on the bank account, uh, deposits and withdrawals, uh, multiples of the same items, things that they don't need, uh, repeated donations to telemarketers, and then unexplained bank withdrawals very important to check your bank records uh, and be able to have the appropriate access to it. And some, some family members, when it comes to a bank account, you might be able to get one level as you get access to uh, the username and password. Um, and that allows you to check. Um, the other way with the bank would be, you could be an authorized signer, you could be a POD, or you could be a joint account owner. Um, that depends on the situation. You need to talk to your attorney to, to, to make sure that it's the right decision. But to, just to overview it, joint owner is um, husband or wife or mother or daughter, and it's on the accounts, on the checks. Authorized signer is not a joint owner. Uh, authorized signer just allows you to be able to manage and sign uh, checks. But what a lot of people don't realize is authorized signer ends upon uh, sometimes upon disability, but definitely ends upon death. Um, and so if there are assets still in the bank account, then the joint owner might be um, more suitable in a lot of situations because there's not this issue of the account being frozen when someone passes away. And then POD stands for payable on death. That's how, that's very important too. You, you, you probably are familiar with having beneficiary designations on IRAs, retirement accounts, CDs, um, brokerage accounts. 
a lot of those institutions do a fairly decent job of telling the account owner to designate a beneficiary. Now, bank accounts, however, whether it's a checking or a savings, they don't always notify the, the account owner that there's a, a procedure where they can designate a beneficiary on the bank account. And so you can go, the account owner would have to go, or the power of attorney on behalf of the account owner would have to go to the bank and say, I want to designate a POD, payable on death. And then you list who you want the payable on death to go to. Um, this is all surrounding the topic of paying careful attention to what's going on in the bank account. Um, because that's going to be, again, one of the probably the number one ways to spot abuse and frauds. Um, you have, you hopefully been able to look over this, but um, there, you can automate a lot of things these days. And that, that allows you, that frees up a lot of your time as well as allows you to kind of monitor the automate, automation. And that's what a lot of people are doing these days. These are the steps. And you, you, you know, you, that's going to be a document that it's going to be helpful as a resource for you. Now let's look at some financial uh, and legal, but you look at income and spending, right? Like, like, like with everything, you write down in and out and you can see pretty clearly uh, how everything's going. You can then anticipate for the ability to have enough assets to pay for the cost of care. You want to look at that there. Look at your assets. Assets are just so people know, you might have a, a car that your name is on the car title, or maybe it's jointly. Uh, you might have your name on a house, whether it's individually owned, whether there's a lien or mortgage, but uh, you might have a life estate deed where it's your name, but you have beneficiaries on the property deed. And a life estate deed is um, a powerful way to have property um, skip the probate process because the life estate owner gets to reside in the house, gets their homestead exemption, uh, gets the step up basis for taxes, and then for their life. And then when they pass away, it automatically goes to the people that is designated on the life estate deed. You want to look at uh, taking an inventory of debt, especially credit cards with the interest rates these days, uh, and then loans you'll have there as well. Look at uh, cost of care. You know, everything that's dealt with in the home, uh, whether it's prescription, uh, whether it's supplies um, or depends or, you know, all the different things that kind of go on. You also want to be able to identify, and this is where it's important to have someone that you trust to kind of be able to monitor what the doctor is recommending for the medication and whatever that is, ensuring that there's a process um, where you can ensure that the medication is being taken um, as well as kind of monitoring that as, uh, or even assisting in that. Uh, personal care supplies. Then you have, you know, adult day services. Um, and that's that, that can be extremely important for not just the social aspect, but also for the caregiver itself to get a moment uh, because they can become a better caregiver if they are, uh, have a little bit more balance in their life. And, and that balance can come from adult day services where someone else is helping out in the caregiver role in home care. And then you have residential can be independent facility where the staff, they're not allowed to do any kind of assistance, but it's more, uh, a, you know, kind of a safe atmosphere and there's different levels of independent. And then you kind of go to the assisted level and a lot of times um, the assisted level or the independent level, you can get a third party private duty nursing to be able to come in and give even a higher level. And then if you need the skilled care, uh, that's the nursing home. And that price, that price goes up quite a lot at that point. And then that's where we look at, you know, what's part of the spend down? How do we reduce the spend down in the event of a nursing home? So if you look here, full-time residential care services, uh, Medicaid can pay for a skilled nursing care facility, but they require an individual to spend down a lot of their assets. Now, 
there are exempt ways to have assets not counted and then those and those assets become non-countable assets and exempt assets, non-countable assets are not required to be spent on the nursing home cost. And Medicaid will pay the whole nursing home bill for the rate that they negotiate. And then the family is able to keep the exempt non-countable assets. Now that's pretty advanced and it's uh, beyond our conversation um, on this talk. You would need to set up a probably a phone co consultation to make sure how do we look at assets that are owned that are considered um, countable, that's part of the spend down, and how do we, it's called reposition, how do we reposition them so that they're considered non-countable in the event of a nursing home? Um, and that's a pre-planning technique. Um, financial responsibilities, automating bills is, is a wonderful way of, of, of kind of helping with that. Um, looking at benefit claims, which is kind of the, you know what touched on, but there are additional benefits. Uh, there's also the way to look at Medicare. Medicare can pay if you're in a nursing, if you're in a hospital for at least three days and you're admitted, you're not under observation, but you're admitted, and then you go into a skilled facility. Medicare can pay for 20 days and then a percentage of 80 days, but it ends at 100 days. Um, and looking at investment decisions, um, getting everything together for tax returns. And so you have this form here that's going to be really helpful to look at your income, uh, your expenses. That way you can calculate with, with a lot of accuracy, which you need, you know, to do um, what the budget's going to be. Now, how do people pay for the cost of care? A lot of times you either self-pay and self-pay is you are probably looking at uh, Social Security, maybe uh, IRA or 401k, and then you have your savings. Those are the more liquid assets. And then you have to go to more of your fixed assets, like maybe you have there's a, a property that needs to be sold. You also have insurance, but a lot of times, um, a lot of a lot of people don't have insurance long term, right? They might have short term, or they might have health insurance but they might not have long-term care insurance and or they can't qualify for long-term care insurance um, for health reasons or age reasons, or it's just gotten too expensive where they can't afford the long-term care insurance. And even individuals with long-term care insurance, sometimes there are these, um, these situations where if you have a, um, a need to use the insurance, insurance might not pay for those expenses um, because you know there's a lot of uh, technical details that are inside these insurance plans that you you have to meet so insurance can be a great way long-term care insurance but for a lot of people they're looking at their personal resources like their savings accounts or their social security and then their government assistance like medicare if you're a veteran um, or if you're a surviving spouse of a veteran, especially if you were a veteran who uh, served during a wartime. And the wartime dates might be broader than you, you feel like they are. Um, so you want to check with a, uh, an attorney to make sure that you or your spouse, if you're a widow of someone who served, served and, and they were active, and they served for at least 90 days and they served in uh, during a war time. If so, and they need home care or they need independent living care or they need assisted living care, right? If they can get some, they could, if they qualify, they can get some veteran benefits. It's called aid and attendance. And aid and attendance will pay for, uh, and, and that, that money can go to a niece if you set it up right. Uh, or or a family member. It can't go, uh, there, there are some exclusions uh, in there, but VA benefits aren't available to everybody. But if you or your spouse serve during a wartime and you meet the medical need, right, uh, especially if you're homebound, you can uh, avail yourself of those benefits and that can make a big impact. Um, I need to check what the number is right now, but a married veteran, 
might be around 28,000 to 30,000 a year uh, in, in benefits. Social Security Disability Insurance, uh, Compassion Allowance Initiative. So there are these federally funded resources that if I was um, meeting with the client, I'd be looking over and making sure that these are looked into. You have state funded uh, Medicaid, which is really a state federal program, Medigap, um, and then there's some additional resources. And Medicaid, which is state and federal, will be available for a nursing home. They're, you know, if you have home care, there's certain needs, um, there's a program of Medicaid that um, is specifically designed for nursing homes only. But you have to qualify for that. And you have to move assets. You have to either spend down assets or you take your countable assets and then you reclassify them, um, whether it's with the trust or whether it's with some other technique that's available, and you reclassify it as a non-countable asset. Legal planning. Make sure you designate a trusted family member or a friend to make decisions. Giving somebody the authority is the name of the game. Uh, that can make, and it's not just a simple, you know, two page power of attorney that says, if I'm disabled, then I designate um, my spouse or my caregiver or my daughter or my friend or my nephew or my brother. I give them the authority to do everything. Well, nowadays, you have to be very explicit in what authority you're granting the individual, the trusted person to make decisions for you if you are disabled. And so that's why you really want a strong, um, it's called an enhanced power of attorney, and you designate, so it's doing two things. One, the name of the game, you're designating clearly who has authority because you're giving that person, when you designate a power of attorney or for healthcare or legal or financial affairs, and they have the authority to handle and sign your name and act as if you're acting, and that's giving somebody a lot of authority. So you got to trust the person that you're you're granting this authority to. And you can give, you can have one person be the individual that is going to make the decisions on your behalf through a power of attorney. You can designate two people or three people, and they can be co. And if you designate co-agents, then you're going to want to um, figure out, do they all have to co-sign or can they act independently of each other? If you give them independent rights, the agents to act on your behalf, and they can act independently, that gives them flexibility. But if you require that they sign jointly, that gives you accountability. That makes sure that, you know, one person doesn't have too much of the control. So there's pros and cons of naming multiple agents um, to make decisions on your behalf. If you have any questions about power of attorneys uh, or anything in ge general questions, feel free to add it to the chat. But a big tip is number one, designating the right person or persons. Um, and then number two is making sure that the powers that you grant that person, that you're giving them very explicit, very um, detailed, uh, and typically very broad powers. That way, when you're trying to act on somebody's behalf who is unable to sign uh, for a mental incapacity, oftentimes, like dementia or Alzheimer's, that that individual who's trying to act on behalf of somebody else isn't limited in what they can do. And then they're not running into walls, they're not hearing from the bank or the, the, the DMV or the Register of Deeds or Social Security or Medicaid office or nursing home. They're having to interact with all these institutions. And each institution will interact with somebody who's the agent on behalf of somebody else only if that person has a really, that has a, a legal power of attorney. And so you want to make sure that that power of attorney is um, gives full authority to your agent to make these decisions so that it specifically says, I grant to my son if I'm disabled, the ability to deal with the bank, you know, needs to say that, I handle real estate, handle social media accounts. A lot of times we add that, handle digital assets, 
um, deal with the federal government, deal with long-term care planning, um, deal with financial institutions, deal with stocks and bonds. I mean, some of the stuff might not even apply, but it's better to have things in your power of attorney and not need it than need it and not have it. So you really want to have a strong document uh, that gives a lot of authority to your agent. In addition to, as it says right here, designating the right people to make those decisions on behalf of uh, someone who doesn't have the capacity. Reviewing documents, making sure they're up to date. You see here a durable power of attorney for finances and healthcare. That's, that's the principal is the person who uh, would be in this scenario, the disabled individual. And then the agent is the, the trusted family or friend person that you're designating. So the principal agent relationship. A living will though is a different document than the power of attorney. So a power of attorney for financial and legal is often called a property power of attorney or a durable power of attorney. Durable means it survives even after disability. Uh, healthcare power of attorneys, uh, sometimes are referred to as advanced directives. Um, but a living will is a very unique situation. And that's where if you are in ever in a situation where if you are permanently unconscious or you are terminal, there's no recovery, there's nothing else the doctor can do. Um, and so then there's this decision. Will you allow the body to die naturally? Um, or will you um, have you know, IV fluids, um, treatment, whether it's rituxan or, 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 or whatever the treatment comes in. Um, there's pain medicine, there's uh, food and water artificially, right? The, so you're on your deathbed. If you have artificial, you know, food and water, saline and medicine coming in, not, med not, not, not pain reliever, but, but treatment, then that body might take longer to pass away then removing the food and water and, and medical treatment, which would allow the body to go into the natural uh, passing. So that's a legal decision, uh, the decision to remove food and water and treatment. And that decision only occurs at the end of life, Terry Schiavo, kind of, if, you, if anybody remembers that scenario, um, permanently unconscious, there's there's nothing else that the doctor can do because the doctor has their Hippocratic oath, they're gonna do everything they can. Um, but at some point, sometimes the doctor says, there's nothing else that we can do. And then do you wanna be left on life support or not? That decision can be made and you can make that in the living will. So it's a very unique situation where the durable power of attorney and the healthcare power of attorney, those that's more, if you need a, a surgery or a healthcare decision, or you need someone to act to handle your finances or sell property or anything legal, financial, or medical that, that's a decision, that can be done by you or it can be done by the power of attorney. And again, you're giving that power of attorney a lot of authority. So you want to make sure you trust that person. You see at the very bottom of this page, because we've already gone through the living will and the power of attorney, a living trust. A trust is uh, like a box and like an LLC, you, you put your real estate into the name of the Smith Living Trust. Now that living trust, that name, Smith Living Trust, you sign and date it, you're the trustee of it, It's your you, you manage everything uh, just as if you own the property in your individual name, but you own it in the trust name. And the reason why people do that is the trust doesn't die when the individual dies because there's a provision there that says, when I die, I designate so-and-so to be my successor trustee. And then that person can manage the, 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 the trust assets and probably sell it and distribute it to your beneficiaries. It also says in there, if I'm disabled, I designate so-and-so to be the trustee in that event. And so it allows them to stay out of court allows the government to not get their hands in it. And when you pass away, there's no need to go through probate because probate fees are anywhere from three to 6% of whatever the gross estate is, which is quite a lot. And if you have the ability to avoid probate, and a lot of times people, especially with real estate, they set up a trust to avoid probate. 
and to make the distribution process easier, saving fees. Uh, you know, there's some long-term care things that can be added to the living trust as well, but that's what a trust is. So I'm just looking here on the left side, you see durable power of attorney for financial health care, living will, and then a living trust. And hopefully there's a, a general understanding of all that. There's also the will. A will is going to send everything to probate. And the purpose of the will is just to make sure you've designated uh, who your beneficiaries are. A trust becomes a substitute for the will because the trust also designates who your beneficiaries are. But unlike the will, assets don't need to go through the probate process. So you want to find help. Well, then there are a lot of resources that are open to you on the financial side and the legal side. Elder law attorney uh, is the typical designation when you're looking for someone who uh, is has the legal experience to help with long-term care type of legal issues. Not just estate planning, but, but in addition to estate planning, a focus on that. Creating a backup plan, talking to family and friends, um, maybe more than one person, having an alternate, so we would designate maybe so-and-so as your power of attorney, your agent, or the individual's agent. And then if they are unable to serve or they pass away or they're just unwilling to serve, it's nice to have a backup to that person, an alternate, and maybe a backup to the backup. Uh, especially if you're you know, going down to the age of like a grandkid who might not be the right age. So you put him as a backup. And maybe if that scenario comes where they're needed, They'll be older at that time. And you can always change these agents fairly easy. The only requirement that you need to change any of your estate planning documents, the main, the main issue is, does that individual still have the mental capacity to sign? Because once they lose their ability to sign, um, then they're going to lose their ability to make these changes. So it's important to have it in place now, like as soon as possible, everybody, all ages having power of attorneys and, and designating the right people. Um, but again, as long as you can sign, you have the ability to make changes. So you're not stuck. Keep an updated list of medical information, all the medications, contact information for doctors. Remember in the very beginning, I mentioned the key person and kind of having a list, putting the, the doctor information right at the top. As a caregiver, you're going to be able to provide better care if you are taking care of your health. There's there's no other way of, of I me. Mean, it's almost as if um, you have to force yourself to make sure that you are eating better, active, you know, being a little bit more physically active, um, and and just having a mental break where you can kind of do some things that de stress. I can tell you, for me personally, um, taking you know ten minutes of walking outside and just feeling the sun, that helps me a lot. But everybody has their own way of doing it. But a lot of people get so lost in in being a caregiver that they just stop taking care of their health, and and that is um, that's going to be very hard on you as well as on the people you're trying to take care of. And so there's some contact information for you. The next steps, um, write down, um, uh, if you're, if anybody was taking notes or I can kind of go into the chat room, but you know, you write down, sorry, I'm just looking at the chats. Okay. Write down your steps. Like, have you got your power of attorneys updated? You have, you know, the bank accounts set up right. Bro, if you want to hop in at any point. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Nick. Um, Michelle, yes, we will send out um, after this that workbook that you saw referenced and then a, um, a PDF of the PowerPoint to be able to have as well, too. 
And then again, most likely this will be able to be shared on the library um, YouTube channel. So you'll be able to come back and access it as well too. Um, there were no, there were a couple um, questions uh, not necessarily related to the topic. So I will go ahead and open up the floor to that, um, Nick. And in fact, I had one that I was not sure about too. Um, when we were talking about Medicaid, and I know that repositioning is a stronger topic to not really dive in, but I did hear, and I wasn't sure if this was true, that if you prepay for your funeral, that could be an expense that that necessarily wouldn't be allocated to that. That is so that's true. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah. So that that's there are there are um there are small ways to um take assets that are countable. Like maybe you say there's fifty thousand dollars in the bank. And there are there are some uh small ways and we can, you know, you you got to be careful kind of on a broad topic um like this, to, you know, to not give specific legal advice and then that's taken and then people feel like okay everything's done and I'm good to go and and then um but that is certainly one of the uh, one of the techniques now that obviously um you know might be ten thousand dollars for a funeral plan that's not going to protect uh, or be exempt a hundred thousand dollars or the house right but it is certainly um, a, a technique that if there are assets that are not needed and that would have to be part of the spend down, then yeah, absolutely. Burial plot um, and a prepaid funeral plan can be qualified expenses. Uh, you, there are even possible ways where you could maybe even set up a, um, a irrevocable funeral trust as well. I had, and I do this for a living and have these, or should have these conversations. And my mom, who's 75, had this conversation with me about wanting to prepay for her funeral. And I kind of brushed it off and I thought, oh my gosh, this is so morbid. I don't want to talk about this, even though I know that we have to. And then I had um, heard that and I said, well, now there's a benefit to, to having this conversation a little bit more. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I found with, a lot of times the topics um, that need to be addressed like this, they 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 can they can only be addressed when the individual is ready to address it. And you might start it and then you might find that it doesn't that you, that they're not ready. But that initial start is fine because it's a seed and you might get, you know, a year from now out of nowhere. Hey, what about what you should I do this? And and so you know, it, it, that's just, it's about the timing as well. Correct. And I had put something in the box that I had heard and I thought um, at a presentation that struck me that knowing what someone doesn't want can be just as valuable sometimes, you know, if it kind of comes up in conversation, maybe you have a neighbor going through something and, oh, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want that to happen to me. Well, at least you've got a little bit to work with now if the person's not willing to say what they, they do want. That's right. And I think um, Michelle had something in the chat um, a little bit. And um, Nick, if you could talk a little bit more about Medicare nursing home qualifications. Okay. So Medi Medicare or Medicaid? I don't know. Whatever you said. I don't remember. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> Medicare is health insurance. My mom has both. Yeah. So, and then okay. Humana as well. So Is she in a nursing home right now? No, she's not, but I just would like to know options just in case. Right, right. So Medicare is not um, for long-term care. Medicare, okay. you know, Medicare is health insurance. Uh, it does have an ability to pay for some long-term care, but it's not on the long-term side of it. It's, you know, it's more uh, 100 days max. And so there are certain requirements where Medicare will jump in and that's great. Um, you know, someone um, close to me, um, with uh, it just recently was in the hospital and had to do a short-term rehab facility. Medicare is perfect for that. We just had to make sure that we could get her home uh, before the hundred days ended, because because then the family's on the hook for that. Uh, Medicaid, that's the that will pay the nursing home bill, right? And so if you 
And, and a nursing home requires skilled care and it's long-term. And so the moment that an individual qualifies medically for the need to go into a nursing home, then you can apply for Medicaid to pay the bill. And Medicaid will pay the bill if the individual, the institutionalized individual spends down all their assets till they're basically broke. Now, they can put their assets into a trust and then five years from that date, the assets aren't countable. And so they go into a nursing home, Medicaid pays, they say, what do you own? They say, we have a trust. And how long have you had the trust? Uh, it's older than five years. Okay, all the, you know, the $300,000 house, it's titled in the name of the trust is safe. It's protected. But some people don't have that five-year ability, right? They can't do it five years in advance. Maybe they're in their 90s. Um, some people will do the trust uh, in their 80s. Um, I've even had some people try to do this five-year trust in their 90s because they thought, well, it's not going to it's not going to hurt too much to try to get past the five-year window. And maybe they go four years from today and go into a nursing home. Then they only have to pay for the one year. And then once they get past that fifth year, then they can apply for Medicaid, right? So it, you can, it can buy you some time. Or maybe they have long-term care insurance that might um, pay for a few years. So maybe they just may have to make it two years. And then the insurance can kick in for three years. Um, or they set it up and they just pay for five years, but they, they know they don't have to pay after five years. Um, but anyways, you, you have your home. And if you have it in a trust, that's a Medicaid qualified trust, then after five years, it's not countable. That's okay. the, that's the, and, and you can also apply for VA benefits. My and that's, mom has zero, zero assets. So, I mean, it's just so we, yeah. social security. That's it. <laughs> it's minimal. Oh, right, right. So it's just, I just get confused on like who to go through, you know, like we just got set up with Humana, like yeah. Medicaid, Medicare, like I never really know the difference, you know, Medicaid, I'm starting to Medicaid learn. Medicaid would be the long-term one. Do they cover all of it? They'll I cover mean, the nursing home bill. The what? They, they'll cover the whole nursing home bill. Okay. Now, when you go to these facilities, a lot of times they'll have admin or they'll have a social worker or they'll have somebody there that at that time, they're going to be your resource. They're going to be able to tell you, um, all right, your Medicare, keep submitting it on Medicare, but when it runs out, um, this is the office that you're going to need to set up an appointment. And a lot of times you can do that within 30 days prior to having to be admitted into a nursing home, um, or you do it at, at the time of admission, but you just, you go in there. And so from a practical perspective, what I found is a lot of times the Medicaid workers, um, they're going to look at you and they're going to think, okay, is this individual going to make my life easier or harder? And so if you're the type of person that goes in there and imagine if you're the caseworker and you see someone come in and they have copies of the last six months of bank records. They have copies of all the social security of the social security award letter and a couple copies to hand. They have the driver's license. They have the birth certificate. Um, they have if there's a, a spouse, they have information documents on the spouse. What they're really wanting you to do is they want you to bring documentation of any income that the individual has, whether it's an RMD, uh, if in your scenario, a social security award letter, um, any income. And then they also want to, they also want to see bank records. And, and now you're coming in there, you know, with a lot of organization and the process is going to go, I'll tell you, it's going to go a lot smoother if you're, if you're prepared and preparing is just getting them having ready all the documents that you need to show proof because they don't want to take your word on anything. They don't want you to say, Hey, mom gets, you know, 1300 a month or, or, you know, no, they, they want, they want you to have proof. They want to see documents because they can't take people's words anyways. And so, so from a practical tip, um, just know that they're human beings as well. And if they see you as somebody who's organized, they're going to, they're going to make the process a lot easier on you. And just knowing as a practical tip that a lot of these institutions, they have people um, that are there to help. They can be your greatest resource.
And then when the individual is in the nursing home, you know, choosing the right place, a lot of the, the dual pay places are good, whether it's private pay and, uh, and then state paid, you know, public pay, uh, like Medicaid, those dual pay facilities are really nice. And then being able to visit as often as possible, that makes a big difference on the quality of care is when the staff, because a lot of times the staff legally, they don't know, they don't know who's paying. So the quality of care should legally be the standard. It should be the same. Um, but from a practical perspective, if they see uh, so-and-so has a family member come in once a week versus someone who never has any family visit, um, you know, things can get, you know, um, it's just better to have um, good organization and being able to pick the right place, dual places, being able to check in as often as you can. And then like the presentation said, taking care of your own health um, by taking those breaks or doing whatever you do to, 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 to balance your health, diet, and exercise. Thank you. And Nick, there was another question. Um, what did you mean by Medicaid qualified trust? Um, so that's just a, um, so there's, there's different kinds of trust. There's a, there's a Medicaid qualified trust there's two different kinds of Medicaid qualified trust. One would be is if income is higher than what is allowed, and then the income can go into the Medicaid, um, into that trust. But the main Medicaid trust that most people think of is a asset protection trust. It's a it's an irrevocable trust where the individual puts their assets in the trust and they designate maybe their spouse, oh no, they designate their kid, or a friend or somebody else as the trustee and you set it up a certain way. Um, and then that trust, if the property is entitled in the name of that trust, you know, it's protected. So, um, yeah. So, you know, Stephen Troll is, um, one of the attorneys that, uh, I like to work with. Uh, he sets these Medicaid trusts up often. I can put you guys in touch. But but I can't go, I can't explain everything in in in, in a, but I can give you a little snippet. It's it, there's different kinds of Medicaid trusts. Um, some are designed just for income, but the ones that most people think of is designed for the assets. And the most common asset that people put into a Medicaid trust is real estate, like the primary residence. That way, they don't have to lose their home, which is a really a big deal. Revocable trusts are not Medicaid trusts. That's correct. But even though you set up an irrevocable trust, you can still put language in there that make you can make changes to an irrevocable trust. For example, if you set up an irrevocable trust and you think, oh, well, I can't ever change it. That's not true. You can change the trustee at any time you want. Do you have control? You can also change the beneficiaries anytime you want. So you have leverage, right? So you can make changes to an irrevocable trust, but on legally, it needs to be an irrevocable, not a revocable. And on that note, Nick, is it okay when I um, send the follow-up with the PDF and the workbook to share um, your professional contact information as well? Um, yeah, if you want to share my, my number and email, not okay. my address, but, um, yeah. <laughs> just, just the number and email. And then, um, and then if somebody needs to be brought in, I can, I can, um, bring somebody in, whether it's a financial or an insurance, uh, professional, I have, you know, contacts being in this field that I can kind of make the introduction and then, and then step out. But at least you have someone that you're familiar with from this talk to be able to help quarterback and give you a little bit of direction. And it was, um, could you repeat the name of the attorney that you mentioned? Uh, Stephen B. Troll. I'll, I'll type it in here. Okay. And does anybody have any um, additional questions? Or um, can we turn it back over to Christina at the library?
All right, Christina, looks like we are good to go. Nick, thank you again so much for your time. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, Christina is going to do a little wrap up so we're able to share where we can get some. Um... Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we do have some, and actually I can pull that up right now. Um, yeah. So what I'm going to do is show you how to access some local resources that we have here through New Hanover County um, through the library and you can go to nhclibrary.gov and what you can do is if you go to uh, research and health over here on the side we have memory care um, <clears throat> selections and so here we try to keep up to date with the types of resources we have here in the library and that we partner with um, we have memory care kits, early, middle, and late stage um, for memory care. We try to keep those updated also with pamphlets and um, outside resource information. We also have general resources, uh, different podcasts, different groups, support groups that are in the area. Um, we know we have um, actually a caregiver support group that meets at Northeast the first Tuesday of every month, um, and that is open to the public. Uh, we have local resources, so local here, Keep Your Area on, um, Area Agency on Aging, the Alzheimer's Association of Eastern North Carolina chapter, the Cameron Art Museum Connections Program just restarted in the fall, um, local books, we do try to keep an updated resource guide for um, books that we are purchasing here for the library for our patrons who have memory care um, concerns in their life, and then upcoming programs um, and community events here. So um, we will, uh, if we do put this up, it will be, the recording will be here on the site as well. So, um, and again, if you all have any questions, if you all have any uh, requests, we do have a request for purchase. If you, there are books that you wanna see that we don't have here. Please let us know. Um, we are always happy to expand our collection as much as possible. So um, Brooke, Nick, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, is there anything else we need to cover before we wrap up? Yep, just I'll remind everyone that I'll send out the materials, um, the presentation, as well as the workbook as well to everyone that was here. Wonderful. Excellent. All right, y'all, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you soon at other programs in the future. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.